Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Richard Orton. Richard is a lawyer and author. His legal career has involved working in private practice, in legal publishing, at the Law Commission, in the Treasury, and as a consultant with solicitors and parliamentary agents in Westminster, the political centre of the UK. He's been a member of the Howard League for Penal Reform for well over half a century, and has agitated against capital punishment and for the legalisation of homosexual behaviour. In addition to legal textbooks, he's the author of two wonderful books on the topic of free will, the nonsense of free will, and the cruelty of free will. Today, we talk about why free will is both a false idea and a harmful one. We kept the conversation short and to the point, and I've added 10 minutes of my own reflections at the end. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I'm here with Richard Orton. Richard, thank you for coming on the podcast. Right, well, thank, thank you very much for having me. It's just going to be a, um, a very interest, in, interesting meeting. Absolutely. Um, so to begin with, maybe we can start with how you first became interested in the topic of free will. Um, well, I was uh, about 14 or 15 years old, um, sitting in a classroom at school, and the uh, lesson either hadn't started or it had started, and I was paying no attention to it. And I was thinking about the idea of cause and effect, how effects are caused and then become causes so that there are chains of causality stretching backwards into the past and forward into the future. Um, and I, I realized that I myself was the product of chains of causality stretching back to a time before my birth. And that what I did in future would be simply an extension of the chain. Um, determinism is causality and um, it does, does rule out free will. Um, believe it or not, I thought I was the first person ever to reach this conclusion. Um, and when I shared it with one or two other boys, they dismissed it out of hand. This idea has stay, stayed with me ever since, as it were. Yeah. And so perhaps you can describe the kind of free will that you're arguing that we don't have. Uh, yes, well, this is important. The um, free will that we don't have is the popular idea of free will, the idea which underlines our justice system. Um, it, it's the idea of free choice. Um, that in any given situation, or in almost any given situation, uh, we really might behave in a way different from the way in which we do behave. And this just isn't so. Of course, there are other conceptions of free will. The um, compatibilist philosophers say that provided you're not being coerced into doing something you don't want to do, uh, you have something they like to call free will. But that doesn't involve free choice. Um, on this view, you're free to do what you want, but you're not free to want what you want. So as they <clears throat> themselves accept, um, determinism still uh, rules. Right. And so I, I was first attracted to your writing by the title of your, your first book, The Nonsense of Free Will. Um, and it really resonated with me because I see free will as a kind of incoherent concept that really can be uh, dismissed as, as nonsense. Um, is that how you see it? Uh, yes, it, yes, it is. Um, if you reject determinism and opt for free will, then by definition, you have to say that people's behaviour is not um, determined. Um, not determined by their being the people they are, not determined by anything. And if an act is undetermined, uh, then it's just a random chance, accidental, inexplicable act, an act which could reflect uh, um, no credit or discredit on the person who does it. And this really is the nonsense of free will. Um, some people accept the importance of determining factors, but still try to believe that there is, uh, must be a little bit of free will in there somewhere. Um, Bishop Richard Holloway, if that rings a bell with anybody, for example, holds this 
belief, but it, it, it makes it makes no sense because uh, a little bit of randomness, a little bit of inexplicability, how could that be? And why would you want it? And actually, how could you identify it? Um, if somebody does something, where's the little bit of free will? Where did that come in? What, what effect did that have? The whole thing falls apart the more you think about it. Absolutely. And so you're also arguing that free will is a harmful concept. Um, in what ways is it, is it harmful? Uh, well, I, I think it's harmful because it purports to justify all the cruelty and injustice which we unleash upon one another. Uh, it's thought to validate all the hatred and contempt and vengefulness and vindictiveness and retribution um, which we keep on people who do things that we consider to be harmful or wrong. Um, and it enables us to dismiss and denigrate people who, um, whose lives are bleak and unsuccessful because we think they could have changed them by an act of free will and to admire the rich and powerful because we think they have done just that. And uh, none of this is fair because people are built to live the lives they lead. Um, it has rightly been said that belief in free will actually leads to people who have become poor or dependent on benefits of homeless or downtrodden and unsuccessful, suffering a double dose of unfairness. Uh, the first dose is the bad biological environmental luck which has caused their situation, caused their plight. And the second dose is the blame and contempt which they suffer because of it. Right. Yeah, so this isn't purely philosophical. This is really important. Um, so to dive into the details, perhaps you could describe the conflict between determinism and, and free will. Yes, well, determinism uh, is usually seen as a, as a bad thing. Um, it has a, a bad press, as it were. Um, actually, it isn't. It's a natural and comforting thing, I think. Um, we come into the world with certain inborn biological characteristics. Uh, those characteristics then interact with um, our parents, carers, environment as a whole, schools as we uh, grow, grow, grow up. And at any given moment in our lives, we are the product of this causal process. Um, we do make our own choices, but we make them the way we do for reasons which may be unconscious as well as conscious, of course. We make them the way we do because we are the people we are. And actually, wouldn't it be alarming if this were not so? Um, those who believe in free will must say that it isn't so. And that really would be alarming. Right. And uh, people sometimes think of free will as the ability to have done otherwise. Um, what are your thoughts on this, this line of thinking? Well, I um, agree with it, of course, but I have one slight um, reservation about it because I think it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, it isn't a question, of course, of the having of, of the physical ability to do otherwise. Uh, my own physical ability is um, diminishing nowadays, but I can still do um, a lot of different things, and so can everybody else. That's not a test of free will. Uh, the real test is whether we actually uh, might have done otherwise. We actually, in the real world, might have done something else. And the answer is uh, no. Uh, we could physically have done otherwise if we wanted to, but we didn't want to. 
Right. Um, and so it seems at a fundamental physical level, uh, physics shows us reality isn't precisely deterministic, but it's instead kind of probabilistic. Um, do you think this is a basis for free will uh, that can be found in, in chance of this kind? Um, no, I, 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 I don't think so for, uh, for two reasons. One is that um, we live in our familiar world, what's called the macroscopic world. And as I understand it, the apparently uh, random behavior of subatomic particles doesn't affect our behavior. Um, the other reason, of course, is that uh, if it did affect our behavior, it would simply make our behavior uh, uh, random and inexplicable. Um, if somebody tells you they, they uh, love you, you don't want to think they've said it by accident. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and when it comes to the social side of, of kind of holding people personally responsible um, with the free will perspective, we're taking them to be the prime cause of their behavior. Uh, so is the idea that we don't create ourselves, is that relevant here? Um, well, yes, it is. Uh, I think um, responsibility has a number of different uh, meanings. Um, leaving aside insanity and coercion, uh, we always are the prime cause of our behavior. And it makes sense to hold us responsible in the sense that if we behave badly, we must expect to be uh, taken to task. But that doesn't mean that we are uh, morally responsible. Um, this is where it's relevant to point out that we don't create ourselves. It's some moral responsibility that is thought to justify all our um, retributory attitudes, to make them deserved. And to my mind, you can't reconcile moral responsibility with determinism. Um, interesting, some philosophers start out by wanting to prove something. Uh, almost all of them do actually, I think. That, and then they try very hard to prove it. And there are philosophers who try to uphold some version of free will, as I say, and there are some version of moral responsibility. I think they do this because that they want to preserve the existing attitudes of the society in which they live and which they've been brought up. Um, and that society, of course, is based on these concepts and they want to be able to think they're right. Um, then, of course, they're shot down by other philosophers who don't take that view and take a more are able to take a more objective view of the subject. Right, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, actually, I, I very much like in your work that it's very to the point, very no nonsense. Um, and whereas you don't get bogged down in the philosophical problems. Um, but so it's, it's worth acknowledging that just because people don't have free will in an absolute sense, we can still take steps to protect ourselves against the harm caused by others. Um, do you think the main change in perspective is in realizing we don't have to like, hate people who cause harm or think that they're like truly at fault in any, in any deep sense? Yes, that's, that's exactly what I do think. Um, society has to protect itself against people who would cause harm and disrupt it. But that doesn't justify hatred and it doesn't justify punishment which is retributory. Right. And why do you think the, uh, the myth of free will is baked into our legal systems? Is it to do with a kind of an emotional need for retribution? Uh, yeah, I think it's baked into our uh, legal system because it's baked into our society as a whole, baked into our uh, legal, legal, emotional attitudes. 
And certainly uh, our emotional attitudes do embody the need for retribution. Um, people sometimes speak of retributory justice, um, but this is, a, this is a contradiction in terms. Retrib retribution is actually unjust and retribution such serves no useful purpose. Um, but of course, any, any, any government which tried to do away with it would be accused of being soft on crime. Um, actually, uh, penal measures which are labeled as soft on crime are actually very often much more constructive, much more useful than um, measures which are labeled as hard on crime. Right. Um, and it seems to me that we use uh, the idea of free will to scapegoat people um, instead of being willing to confront the social issues that drive people into crime. Um, does that perspective resonate with you? Uh, yes, very, um, very much so. Um, crime is determined and the only way to reduce it is to tackle the uh, determinants. Um, not an easy job. I mean, the determinants go right back into uh, problem families and uh, not easy to identify them, not easy to help them and not much effort is ever made to to do that, I don't think. But um, that's the way it is at the moment. Right. And what are the implications of our lack of free will for the legal system? You know, do you think we could aim for total prison abolition, for example? Well, this is difficult. Um, some criminals are so dangerous that they do need to be confined until such time as they cease to be a danger. They don't deserve this, uh, but that's, that's the way it has to be. Um, then again, there has to be some deterrent to crime um, until such time as the causes of crime are eliminated, uh, should that ever happen, uh, potential criminals must know that there is some price to be paid if they commit a crime. Uh, but subject to those points, the overwhelming purpose of penal policy uh, certainly should be rehabilitation. Um, we do need to keep some places of detention. They not necessarily prisons as we, uh, as, as they now exist, but I do think that very many offenders can go on living in the community. Uh, surveillance techniques nowadays make this much more of a possibility, I think. Right. And so in your work, you're offering a rational argument against the existence of free will. Um, do you find this approach is generally successful or do you think there's also a significant emotional component at play? Uh, this, is in, this, is, this, is, this is an interest, interesting question. Um, I don't really know whether it's successful or not, but I suspect that it isn't successful in any real sense. Um, illustrate this, in, in, in 2014, uh, several executions in America by lethal injection were botched, leaving the offenders to gasp and groan and choke, struggle, writhe in apparent agony for periods between half an hour and two hours. Um, and some American citizens' um, reactions to one of these events were um, reported and among the things they said was um, were what that guy got he deserved, who cares if he feels pain, serves that piece of crap right, hope it was painful for him, horrible end to the life of a horrible uh, man uh, and if you can't handle the punishment don't commit the crime and so on. Um, 
Now, you may think that these are untypical reactions, but I rather doubt it. I happen to read the Times the newspaper. Uh, I sometimes wondered why, but um, the Times has, a, has an online facility for readers to comment on, on its contents. And you might think the readership of the Times, present company accepted, um, would be relatively thoughtful and well-informed and uh, educated and so on. But whenever there's a story about a particularly unpleasant criminal, there are hundreds of comments filled with the most vindictive um, hatred and calls for condign punishment uh, when this happened recently, the comments were closed down, had to be closed down, presumably. Um, all these attitudes depend for justification on the idea of free will, which is an idea so incoherent that it doesn't actually justify anything. But to accept the non-existence of free will and to discard these attitudes uh, is probably a step too far for most people. And it's one thing to accept uh, determinism, um, paying lip service to it, and quite another thing to accept it emotionally. Mahatma Gandhi was asked what he thought of Western civilization. Uh, at one, one occasion, he replied that he thought it would be a very good idea. Um, I do believe that rejecting the concept of free will and the attitudes it fosters would be an important step towards a better civilization. Uh, but it would happen very gradually if it happens at all, and probably implicitly rather than explicitly um, the penal regime in Scandinavian countries is actually less punitive and more constructive um, and more successful than the regimes in this country and uh, America. I don't think this is because their citizens expressly reject free will. Uh, they just see the sense of uh, basing their regime on the idea of understanding and rehabilitating uh, offenders. Great. And so are there any um, remaining issues that we haven't touched on in this area or any, any final thoughts you want to share? Um, I, 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 I don't think there are actually, so thank you very much. Yeah. No, thank you. This has been wonderful. Since Richard and I have quite different backgrounds uh, in law and science respectively, I thought I would share some thoughts of mine um, on this topic. So before I go into the science side of things, I wanted to comment on, on Richard's point about the, um, the man who was executed and the public's reaction that he, he deserved the, the pain that happened when the execution went wrong. Um, there was a study where people was shown footage supposedly of people um, receiving electric shocks. I believe there were actors kind of pretending in the videos. Um, and then the psychologists who were doing the experiment asked the participants um, questions about what they thought about the person they saw in the video being electrocuted. And the responses, the, the kind of negative assessment of the character of the person being electrocuted increased as the severity of the shock increased um, in appearance in the video. So you have a situation here where if someone's really in pain, if something really unfortunate has happened to someone, you're more likely to think they're a bad person. Now, kind of logically, that's there's no evidence there that they're a bad person. Um, so there's not a rational kind of decision-making process going on here in how you assess the person's character. But what there does seem to be is an emotional kind of self-protective, anti-empathetic response where in order perhaps to 
conserve your emotional resources, you see someone in pain and you say like, okay, I'm not going to care about them. They're probably awful. They probably deserve it. Um, which I think is really interesting and, and is really at the core of this, this issue of, of when we see someone who is deeply, deeply unfortunate, you know, say they're, they've been raised in poverty with, with, you know, multiple, um, you know, uh, things that might, uh, impact their life negatively. So there's addiction in their family and, and there's just, everything's going wrong and there are these huge systemic problems. That's a big task. If you're going to say that we need to save that person, right? You basically need to change all of the kind of, um, unequal systems, uh, in society. So it's far easier just to say they probably deserve it. Um, and that allows you to get on with your day. So I think, I think this is part of the reason we make decisions to, to blame people as the cause of, of their behavior rather than the actual causes. Um, and so this comes down to like, you know, if there's no free will, if it's, if it's really as simple as that, um, and this is why I quite like, I like Richard's work is it's very to the point and very kind of no nonsense, um, just saying there isn't free will, which I agree with. But then why do we think there's free will? Why are we even having this conversation um, if it's that straightforward? And I think it's because if you think of living systems, we are we're kind of relatively autonomous from our environment. Not entirely. We're still, you know, as a, a kind of land mammal, I can only exist in this thin layer of oxygen, you know, between space and the earth. Um, this sorry, this thin layer of atmosphere. Even if I go into the sea, suddenly I can't function as this this system that's exchanging um, exchanging resources with the environment. So I'm a kind of feature of this niche, but I can move around the niche quite freely. Um, the dynamics are such that I, you know, as a living system, take on a level of autonomy, and this applies all the way down to kind of single cells. You know, um, a rock in an avalanche that can, you know, that when some, when forces act on it you can really see there's not much in the nature of the rock that's going to determine what happens. There's a little bit, you know, it's mass perhaps, you know, but with very simple physical equations, you can see the, um, how it's acted upon and how it doesn't really make sense to say the rock that's being hit is the cause of its movement. You know, you can really attribute it to the actual cause. But then with us, because we're this complex, um, self-creating, self-sustaining open system, there is, um, it makes sense to attribute our choices, you know, to the organism, to this complex physical system. Um, so if I, you know, move towards a piece of food or another piece of food, the, it's right to attribute the causality to the autonomous, the relatively autonomous life form rather than, you know, sort of like the analogy of a rock hitting, hitting me. But it doesn't change the fact that there's still a huge web of causality that leads me to decide whatever I'll decide. And so it's not that, you know, people can resist the idea of, of non-existence of free will because they think it's that they're being kicked around by the physics of the universe. But it's more that you are the physics of the universe. It's happening through you. So you can still make choices in line with your nature, with what's best for you. Um, you can still act rationally or in your own um you know, self-interest or, or, you know, you're not just randomly, um, doing things. So there is choice, but it's just not this, this fairy tale version of absolute free choice where it kind of magically comes into existence at some point. There's this web of causality that's happening through you. Um, and there's not any other magical ingredient. And I think we should be happy with that situation. You know, I can, I will choose what I will choose in line with my own nature and circumstances. And I think that's how it should be. I don't want to suddenly, you know, as Richard said, I, you don't want to, if someone tells you they love you, you don't think it's down to some random quantum fluctuation that they don't really mean it. Um, you want it to be signaling a truth about your circumstance and your relationship to this person. Um, and so I want my choice of food to be based in my history of food preferences, what I think is nutritious. I don't want it to just be random and come out of this kind of magical, magical free will. Um, yeah. And I think the, if, if this doesn't sound like a kind of an appealing, um, way of seeing the world, people often find meditation that just observing the contents of consciousness, they realize that there is just this, um, existence is just this kind of unfolding of things happening with no, 
there's nothing else. It's just this this causal associative um, chain of, of of an unfolding process. And when you settle into that and you drop the kind of the stress that goes along with wanting to control the world, which is really, you know, free will comes out of the idea that the ego, the self is this kind of puppeteer controlling everything. And it's the self that creates suffering. So if you let go of that, you can really be left with a very positive feeling about this, um, this lack of, of free will. Um, yeah. And so I think with, with the deep attachment, it's always from this, this, um, from the, you know, thinking the, the ego or the self is in control. And what comes to mind is this, this perspective of the self as a kind of PR agent for the organism, um, which I spoke about with Robert Wright. And in that perspective, you know, as an organism, there's this bottom up unfolding process. And then there's this psychological module, uh, which is associated with language that can spin a good story about what's happening with this organism. So I instinctively grab a banana because my blood sugar is low happens entirely, you know, without the conscious self, um, noticing it. But then you turn to me and you say, why are you holding a banana in your hand? I'll look at it and I'll, I'll know because I'm a functioning system. I'll have kind of, I'll understand why you might be holding a banana for nutrition, but also the kind of social relationships and stuff. So I can, I can tell a good story. I can say, oh, it's, it's because I'm hungry, even though I haven't consciously, it wasn't that the, the self noticed the organism was hungry and then willed it to grab a banana, it grabbed a banana, asked about it, spun a good story, and it signals to the other person that you're a kind of functioning system. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed speaking to, to Richard. I hope you don't mind that we kept the interview rather short and to the point. Um, and I hope you enjoyed my, my thoughts in the end as well.